Hello everyone. Welcome to our Facebook Live today. Thank you so much for joining us. Another Facebook Live at the beginning of 2022 that we are kicking off this great year with. We are so excited about all the fantastic content that we have lined up for you out there at home um, or from your office or from wherever you are located at the moment. It's always great to do genealogy on the go as well. So thank you to everyone for joining us. We have so many great sessions lined up for you uh, for the coming weeks and months so make sure to check out our blog blog.myheritage.com with a list of all of our upcoming facebook live sessions and we hope that you can join us at all of them <laughs> so uh, i see some happy new year comments there so happy new year to everyone in the audience uh, we hope that everyone has lots of genealogy goals and plans for the coming year we know that we have lots in store for you here at my heritage to kick off 2022 lots coming up uh you know you just have to stay tuned and uh, you'll see you'll see what we have in store but really great things and uh, we hope for a great 2022 uh, as we all do in many many respects so Let's kick off today's session. Uh, we have with us Glenn Burroughs, and he'll be talking about wills and how they help sort out family relationships. A very fascinating session lined up for you today. And before we jump in, I will just uh, let you know about a new feature that we released recently. We posted on the blog yesterday about the MyHeritage, uh, the new photo list view that we have for photos. It's a very exciting new view that we have for viewing your family photos on MyHeritage. We'll put a link in the comments section. So it just makes MyHeritage an even more amazing place to store your family photos and uh, be able to add new metadata to your family photos, organize them, sort through them. Uh, it's fantastic if you have, you know, so many different family photos that you want to keep track of and preserve for future generations. So make sure to check that out. We'll put a link to that in the family in the uh, comments section. In addition, today we'll be giving away a My Heritage Complete plan to one lucky winner in the audience. So we're thrilled to be able to to do so. Uh, and all that you have to do to enter in today's draw is just leave us a comment in the comment section and let us know about a recent family history discovery that you've made using MyHeritage. You know, whether it be colorizing a photo and noticing a detail that you didn't know about before, or perhaps finding something in a historical record on MyHeritage about a family member, we'd love to hear about it. So leave us a comment in the comment section and we'll choose one winner at the end of today's session to win the MyHeritage Complete Plan. It's the best plan we have to offer at MyHeritage. It'll give you unlimited access to 16 billion historical feature, historical records, sorry, uh, advanced DNA features, um, uh, unlimited family tree size, access to all of my heritage photo tools, and so much more. So really a fantastic, fantastic giveaway. So let us know, and uh, we will be choosing our winner at the end of today's session. Uh, in addition, as always, please leave comments, questions throughout today's session in the comments section, and we hope to uh, answer some comments at the end. We hope to be able to get to that. So now let me introduce our speaker today. We have with us Glenn Burroughs. Uh, he's been interested in history since childhood, listening to the stories of his grandparents about their lives in domestic service and on the farms of Norfolk. He um, just has so much so much uh, experience in family history. Over the last decade, he's been running Norfolk Tours, a service for family historians who want to visit the places connected to their own family history. Uh, and maybe he'll tell us a little bit more about that. He also is married with two adult children, three beautiful little granddaughters, and uh, he hopes that his family will inherit his passion for family history. And uh, hopefully he'll tell us a little bit more about his passion and how he originally got into into it. So let me bring him onto the screen here to say hello to everyone. Let's get it up here. Hello, Glenn, how are you? Hello, yeah, great, thanks. Yeah, lovely to be here. Fantastic having you. Thank you so much for joining us. Looking forward to it. Great. So 
why don't you uh, you know tell us a little bit more about your background before you before you jump into the, your slides? Well, as I as I said to you earlier today, I've had quite a long life, so my uh, my biography is a little bit longer than some. Um, I was born in a little village in the middle of Norfolk, and I discovered quite early on in my family history research that my mum's family has actually lived in that village since at least 1620. So the village I grew up in was indeed my, my family home. Um, my parents still live there. Um, so I, I found that I was a, a Norfolk dumpling, as we call ourselves in Norfolk. And um, I started to research my family history in, in around about 1977, I started. And I found that all of my ancestors that I discovered lived in, in the same area. In fact, I've discovered even up till now that all of my ancestors live within 50 miles of where I live today. That's so that, incredible. That, yeah, that is totally incredible. And I am, I really am proud of calling myself a local because all of my ancestors lived here. Um, some of them traveled. I mean, one of my distant um, grandfathers actually served in the army and ended up in Nova Scotia in, in Canada. He was in Halifax in 1815. Um, he came back or, because I wouldn't be here if he didn't come back. Um, but he came back to England and, and stayed where he was where he was brought up. But a few years ago, my wife and I went to Halifax and I was able to go to the to the place where he was uh, where he served in 1815. So that's one of the reasons why I, I, I started um, enlarging my business about touring where your ancestors lived because it's really, really amazing to actually stand in the places where your ancestors stood. And what I try and do in my business is, is take people to the churches where their family were born, were baptized, christened, you know, married, where they, the graves where they were buried, so you can actually stand where they're buried, to visit the houses they lived in, you know, wow. all the sorts of stuff that give you the tingle up the back of the spine. You, know, so you must experience a, a lot of emotion oh, from, yes. from people. <laughs> one, one, of my, one of my big warnings to my customers is that you may well end up in tears. So I, you know, <laughs> I do make my customers cry. And, and when I do that, I realize I've succeeded. <laughs> so they have to bring tissues as part and of the, I, part I of normally, the journey. I normally, I normally have a box of tissues with me. <laughs> Incredible. Wow. Okay. Well, we'll put a link up also to your site as well um, in the comments section so all of our viewers can check it out. Uh, shall I bring up your slides now? Uh, please do. Yes. Okay. So let's get those up. And uh, here we go. Okay. We can, we can see them now. So feel free to take it away. So you've got that as the, uh, as the full page, have you? Yeah, it's, it's up there as a full page. Lovely job. Right. Well, um, as I said, my name's Glyn and I run Norfolk Tours. Um, and we're going to talk today about using wills for family history. Um, a lot of people think that wills are only for rich people. And the, the will that you can see at the moment is for a very rich person. Um, but it just goes to show that most wills are roughly the same. They start off the early wills definitely start off in the name of God um, because that's what they all used to start with. Um, and this one just goes on to say in the name of God and the glorious and blessed Virgin, our lady, St. Mary and all of the holy company of heaven. Oh, we, Henry, by the grace of God, King of England, France and Ireland, defender of the faith, etc., etc. So this is actually the will of Henry VIII. So it is it is just going to show that you can find wills of people from the King of England right the way down to some of my ancestors who were just agricultural laborers. But wills can go on to actually help you to sort out relationships within families who use the same family names for their children. How many of us have actually already found that you know, you've got a family where they had four or five sons and these four or five sons then call all of their children the same names. And it's really difficult to differentiate between John's son, John, 
and Edward's son, John, and Matthew's son, John, because they're all roughly the same ages and they all live in the same area. So that can make it really difficult to differentiate which which John married Mary and which John married Margaret. You know, so a will can really help, especially if you've got families of the same names in the same area. So whether that be in a small town or a small village, a will can often give you that extra bit of help. They can also help to give information about where people came from and their connections to other places in the country or even foreign lands because I've had a will that was um, to one of my distant uncles who lived in a little village in the middle of Norfolk and he actually mentioned a relation of his who lived in Canada. So it really gave me a fantastic link and a jump across the ocean to find this other family that had emigrated to Canada. Now, there is no way on earth that I would have found that information if it hadn't have been for that will. So wills can give you some amazing little snippets of information. Now, most wills are going to be very similar. Like I say, most wills will begin in the name of God but they will give you certain information. They will give you the name of the testator, who is, in that case, Henry VIII. Um, so the person who made the will is the testator. It will tell you where he lived normally, and it will tell you his trade or his profession. It will tell you the date that the will was drawn up. It will give you the witnesses to the will. Now, the witnesses can be really useful because very often people made a will and they were making a will and they had their neighbours to witness. Um, they may have just had the, the, the solicitor to witness or they could have had family members to witness. Now, obviously, if you witnessed a will, you couldn't normally benefit from it. Um, so you wouldn't normally find close family members witnessing wills, but you could easily find some relative who would witness a will. So it's always very important to take note, not only of the people who are mentioned in the will as uh, beneficiaries, but also the people who witnessed the will, because that can also give you some clues. It will give you the date that the will was proved and the date and the, and the person who proved it. It's normally a, a local body in the church for ones before 1858. We'll come into that a little bit early, a little bit later on. So it will also mention the people and the places that the testator wants to benefit. So it will mention the people who they want to leave goods, money, property, whatever to. And that needn't necessarily just be people. It can be places too. So very often, especially in the early wills, you will see people leaving money to the church. They will leave money so that the local church will be saying prayers for them. They may leave money to rebuild the chancel or to buy a new bell or, or something like that. So you will, you will find people and places mentioned in wills. And all of those are really important to keep a note of because you never know when you're going to need that little piece of information. So most wills will have that information in them. Sadly, some wills will just mention one person. And some wills don't even actually mention anybody by name. They just say, I leave everything to my wife. Now, that isn't any good to anybody who's researching family history because it doesn't even tell you the wife's name. But some wills mention several people. Some wills are very short and very simple, and some are long and complicated. Obviously, Henry VIII's will is very long, very complicated, and is full of legal jargon. But some wills are really, really short. I've just put down here because I was reading a, a little bit about uh, Howard Carter the other day, and I thought this really sums it up. 
um, some wills are opening a door to an empty room and some of them are like when Howard Carter first glimpsed the tomb of Tutankhamun when he said, I see wonderful things. And some wills are just like that. You see a will and you think, wow, just look at that information. And sometimes just one little piece of information can make you say, wow, like the information about the relations who lived in Canada. So what does a will look like? Well, this is a will. Uh, most wills that you find online and the wills that you find in record office and such like are copies of wills that were put in big books. So this is a book that is a transcript of the will. So this will is um, to William Lane. He made it in 1809. And by looking at the parish registers, I discovered that he was 91 when he died. So this will tells you here that it is of William Lane. He was of Wiesnam in the county of Norfolk. And he was a husbandman, which means he was a small holder, a small farmer. And he says here that John Barnard and Elizabeth, his wife, who is my great granddaughter. And they now live with me, well, now reside with me. So this is telling me already that this man, even if I didn't find out that he was 91 by looking at the parish registers, this tells me that he's quite old because he's got a great granddaughter and she's an adult because she's already married. And that she lives with him in his house at Wiesnum. So at the time of his decease, John Barnard and Elizabeth were living with William Lane. And his will goes on to say that if they live in the house for the two years after his decease, they will then inherit the house. Tells you a little bit about the house. It's a, a tenement or a cottage with land, ground and premises at Wiesnum. And he gives all of that to John Barnard and Elizabeth, his wife. If they stay living in the same house for two years on the condition, it says there, nevertheless, and upon condition that they do and shall pay to my daughter, Sarah Franklin, and to my eight grandchildren, Mary Hilden, William Lane, Robert Lane, Elizabeth Everett, John Franklin, Anne Fra Franklin, and Sophia Franklin, and Charlotte Franklin, the sum of 40 shillings apiece. So there you go. There is William Lane. He's 91. He's living in a little village in Norfolk. And he tells us not only about his great granddaughter and her husband, it tells me about his daughter and his eight grandchildren. It goes on to say here that um, the tenement and the, the property will go with um, John and Elizabeth as long as they pay 40 shillings. Now, the 40 shillings, we have to then, if you don't already know about old money in England, it is what is now two pounds in, in, in money. 40 shillings is two pound. There used to be 20 shillings in a pound. So it was two pound in money, which doesn't sound a lot now, but it was a lot of money in 1809. So it tells you here that uh, John Barnard and Elizabeth were executors of the will. In other words, they were responsible for carrying out the wishes of his will. And in witness here, he sets his hand on the 26th day of January in the year 1809. So he made his will in January 1809. This tells you here that just a, a summary of the information in the will. So it's William Lane, John Barnard and Elizabeth, his great granddaughter. His daughter was Sarah Franklin. Eight grandchildren are all there. So the will goes on there to say that William Lane made the will and uh, made the will in uh, January. He signed his name with a cross. And he made the will in the presence of us who in his presence and request in the presence of each other have subscribed our names as witnesses, um, William Stokes Jr., William Stokes and John Middleton. So they are the witnesses to the will 
and it tells you there that they were all in the presence of the, of William Lane and they were all in the presence of William Lane at the same time. So in other words, he didn't sign his paper once with William Stokes Jr., once with William Stokes Sr. They were all together in the room when he made the will. And it also tells you here this will was proved at Wiesnam, which is the village he lived in, on the 17th of August before Robert Charles, the Reverend Charles Campbell. So that was the local vicar. So he died between January and August 1809. And that can be checked, obviously, in the parish registers. But it gives you there that, um, so this is what happened. And it was all duly sworn and everything was carried out. Further research in the parish registers and other wills enlarged the family. And the property itself can be traced from 1590, when it appeared on an early map, up until today. The reason I'm really interested in William's will was because I lived in that house from the age of 13 months, and that's where my parents still live. So the house that he left to his great granddaughter is the house that I grew up in. So that really is a, a personal interest to me. It doesn't give me much information about the house itself, but it gives me a lot of information about the people who lived there. And that's, that's really interesting. So that will gives you three generations of a family. It gives you, um, we can see here, William Lane, John Barnard and Elizabeth, who was his great granddaughter, Sarah, who was William Lane's daughter. So it gives you four generations. Then it gives you grandchildren, which are all along there. And then Elizabeth, who was the great granddaughter. So obviously it gives you a lot of other information to to tie in and to research further with your other your other sources of information. So we go on to this one, which is a little bit later. As you can see here, it's 1837, so it's 1837. And this one is for Dorothy Taylor. So Taylor is quite a common name in England. And being Kings Lynn, which is quite a large town in Norfolk, there will be a lot of people called Taylor in Kings Lynn. So it says here, this is the last will and testament of Dorothy Taylor of Kings Lynn in the county of Norfolk, who was a widow. So it tells you a little bit about her already. So we know that she's a widow. We knew that she lives in Kings Lynn. She made the will, as I said, in May 1837. And the first thing she says here, is that she wants to be buried at the parish church of Congham. So do, she doesn't want to be buried in Kings Lynn. So that is another little thing for us to follow up in other documents to see why she wanted to be buried in Congham. It's more than likely that that's where her family came from. And it then goes on to say that she appoints her nephew, Robert Sparkle, as the executor. So it then gives us a little bit more information. A little bit further down, she says here, she bequeaths unto Sparkle Tyler, John Tyler, Jane Thompson, Sarah Tyler, and Margaret Meeking, the five children of my late husband by a former wife. So it tells me there that her ex or her husband, who's died, was previously married and had those five children, at least. Obviously, he may well have had some that, that died in infancy. But it tells me there that there were them five children. And if we needed to know the, the parents of Jane Thompson, who was a tailor before she was married, then we've got a very big clue. And we now know that Jane Thompson, who was a tailor before she was married, had these brothers and these sisters. So it gives us a lot of information to go on. So it goes here um, about all different things. And then we get down here, which is really fascinating. And I give and bequeath unto my brothers, Thomas Lubbock, William Lubbock, and Robert Lubbock. In other words, she's now telling us her maiden name. So even if we haven't found her wedding, we now know that she was a Lubbock. And it tells her how much she wants to give. And then she says, my sister's Eliza, the widow of Edward Beck and Catherine Lubbock. So she's got two sisters there. 
She then goes on to talk about her nieces. So she has nieces, Mary Lubbock and Anne Lubbock. And then she goes on to re-mention her, her stepchildren and her sister, Anne Sparkle. So Anne Sparkle is the mother of Robert Sparkle. So it goes on to give us all this information just in one small will. So this information is what we get from looking at that will. So we have Dorothy Tyler, who's a widow of Kings Lynn. She had her will and she made that in 1837. She wanted to be buried in Congham, which is a village outside Kings Lynn. She had a nephew, Robert Sparkle, and nieces, Mary and Charlotte Sparkle. They were probably his sister, but obviously that needs to be checked. Then she had Sparshall Taylor, John Taylor, John Thompson, Jane Thompson, sorry, Sarah Taylor, Margaret Meeking, the five children of her late husband by a former wife. So it tells us that side of her family. Her brothers, Thomas Lubbock, William Lubbock and Robert Lubbock, giving us her maiden name. Her sister, Eliza, the widow of Edward Beck and Catherine Lubbock. And her nieces, Mary Lubbock and Anne Lubbock, her sister, Anne Sparkall, and the four children of Anne Sparkall, William, Mary, Charlotte and Robert. So it gives us a lot of information just from one document. So it just goes to prove what you can find out from a will. So you can find out family relationships and you can find out how all of these different people with sometimes very common names are all related and how they all fit together, which is the most difficult thing to do by using things like parish registers. Um, even the early census doesn't give you relationships. Now, talking about the census, this will comes just after the 1841 census, but before the 1851 census. So it, it's here, look, Peter Turner. Again, Turner is a very common name. He lived in Kings Lynn as well. He was a druggist, which is a, a chemist, you know. And he made his will on the 19th of December, 1845. So in the middle of the 1841-51 census period. And he just um, nominates and appoints uh, David Menzies of Kings Lynn, uh, an iron founder as his executor. And he basically leaves everything to David's daughter, so is my affectionate friend, Christiana Menzies of Kings Lynn, the aforesaid spinster, daughter of the same David Menzies. So his will doesn't actually tell us very much about family relationships or anything until you get to this little bit at the bottom. He says here, and all the residue and remainder of my personal estate and effects unto my father, Peter Turner, of the city of Edinburgh in Scotland. So there is this young man, because his father is still alive. Well, I say he's a young man, I found that out later. Um, this young man, who's, his father is still alive, and he tells us his father lives in Edinburgh. Now, Kings Lynn is in Norfolk, which is in East Anglia um, in England. And there is no way that we would have found out that Peter Turner came from Edinburgh without his will. The will, the, uh, the census of 1841, Peter Turner was still living in Edinburgh with his father. And in 1851, obviously, he was already dead. So there was no way that we were going to find out where he came from. When he was buried, it just said that he was 25. Yes, he was a very young man. Um, he was buried and it just said Peter Turner, age 25. It didn't tell us anything apart from that. So without the will, there is no way that we would have found anything about Peter Turner. And we would have not found what happened to Peter Turner because his family were in Edinburgh. Now, as it happens, Christiana Menzies and her father, David, went back up to Edinburgh and that's where they were in 1851 and actually Christiana got married in 
1855, I think it was. Um, so without this will, there would have been nothing to tie all of those people together. Um, and that is a fantastic piece of information. Now, as it happens, this will um, is to a single man. So he hasn't got any descendants, as far as I'm aware. Um, but even so, it, if you have a lead from a will like this, then it can put you in a completely different place and it gives you so much more information to then follow up because this Peter Turner who died in Kings Lynn actually was just a person. There was no information about him at all in the burial register. If it weren't for his will, we wouldn't have found anything about him. So it told us that Peter Turner of Kings Lynn mentioned his father, Peter Turner of Edinburgh, and it gave a completely new tack to follow up, which is absolutely amazing to us family historians. And looking at finding information about foreign origins, um, this is some notes to an administration. Now, an administration was when somebody died without a will. And this administration had to appoint somebody to settle somebody's affairs. So one of the papers was this, which says here, the third day of February, 1854, appeared personally Matthias Bihar, formerly of Baden in Germany, then of Kings Lynn, uh, in the county of Norfolk, and now in the city of Norwich, a watchmaker. And he makes oath that Lawrence Bihar, late of the city of Norwich, watchmaker, deceased, was his late uncle, that he knew him well at Baden about 10 years since when he came to, with him to England and settled in Kings Lynn for his business there, it says there, as a watchmaker. And he was with him at Lynn about four years, and then they came with him to carry on his trade at Norwich, where he was with him about six years up to the time of his being so cruelly murdered. So his will has given me not only all that family information and the story that he went from Baden in Germany to Kings Lynn and then to Norwich. It then gives me another thing to look at to find out about him being murdered. And it says here, and that his said uncle died a bachelor, leaving a mother, Magdalena, looks like Ferdera, whom he knew at Baden aforesaid, when she, where she now resides. Um, and then tells me that he, she was the mother of the deceased. And that Andreas Bihar, the person now um, sorting out the property, uh, is also residing in Baden, and he knew him as the brother of the deceased. So it tells us quite a few members of this Lorenz Bihar's family. It tells you his brother, his mother, his uh, nephew, and it also tells us that he's murdered. Now, the reason I found the will or the, the administration was because I'd already found out that Lorenz Bihar had been murdered. I'd found all the newspaper reports about it all. Um, but I hadn't found out that his mother's name was Magdalena. Um, the newspaper reports told me that he came from Baden, and it, other sources that I'd looked through, found I found out that he previously worked in Kings Lynn, but this actually gives me timescales. It tells, tells me when they settled in Kings Lynn, when they came to Norwich. So this little piece of writing here is absolutely full of information and it's the sort of information that you're not going to get anywhere else you know like i say the newspaper reports of the man's murder which we read about here um just gave information about local stuff it didn't tell me very much about his family in germany so it then gives another link back to where he originated from and more about his his life which is basically what, as a family historian, I want to do. I want to know about people's lives. I don't just want their names and their dates. I want to know more about them as people. And these sort of things really help to add information. 
So it tells you here that he was a German from Baden, living in Norwich at the time of his murder. The document was dated 1854. Um, his murder, and there is a lot of information in the newspapers at the time, can be found in 1853. And I can tell you the person responsible was actually hanged uh, in Norwich Castle um, for the murder. And it was quite a despicable murder, um, which I won't go into at the moment because it's not very nice. Um, now sometimes particular heirlooms can be traced when they're first divided amongst the family. I mean, this will mentions a, a soup ladle, a family Bible, a prayer book, a fish slice, a large trust of jewels, a workbox, a writing desk, a watch, and a coral necklace, a dressing chest of drawers and a mirror. So you can see here that he said that this lady says here, I give and bequeath to the Reverend Charles Bouton my soup ladle for his life. And after his decease, I give the same to the said George Henry Bootle. Absolutely. So not only had she given it to Charles, but she's also saying that when he dies, it's going to go to Henry or George Henry. Um, she also gives to George Henry my family Bible and the prayer book to William Carter, my fish slice, to Mary Ann Raven, my large trust of drawers, workbox, writing desk, watch and coral necklace, and to Mary Young's, my dressing chest of drawers and glass. Now the glass is, a, is the old fashioned way of saying a mirror as a looking glass, as in Alice through the looking glass, a looking glass is a mirror. So um, it gives you loads of information about this person and what she felt was important. So to her, her soup ladle was one of the things that she wanted to make sure went to certain people and her fish slice. So more than likely, they're probably silver. And actually, they might still well be in the family because we get things handed down. But you can trace it right back sometimes to these these wills where they are actually given out. I mean, the coral necklace must have been something pretty special. I mean, a coral necklace in England at those times would have been pretty special. So, you know, very often you will see things like that given out. More often, you will see things like the bed, hangings, horses, carriages, things like that. So that's what you can find. Now you need to know where you're going to find them. That's the most important thing. So quickly, and I realize what the time is because I'll be having Esther shouting at me in a minute. Um, after 1857, wills are found in probate records and they are national. So they're English, they're, they're all over England uh, and Wales. Scottish system is slightly different. So, you know, there are differences with the parts of uh, the UK that you live. Um, that website, which we see there, you'll need to find the name and the year to search the indexes. But what you can find through MyHeritage is the information that you'll need to put into that search. And then you'll be able to actually order the probate record. Um, I think at the moment it's only £1.50. Um, so you'll be able to get your information from MyHeritage, Heritage, put it into that search, and then order the actual will. So that will be quite handy and that will give you a, a, a really good shortcut using my heritage to be able to get that information because you need the surname and the year before you can search the indexes um, also on my heritage you can find the england and wales death indexes so they will be able to point you to, to names and dates um, the deaths and burials and obituaries also on on my heritage um, the England and Wales Index of Wills and Probates, that will give you more information for you to then go to the .gov site. Um, MyHeritage also has UK Burial and Cremation Indexes. The Commonwealth War Graves, which will give you information about soldiers because soldiers very often were made to make a will when they joined up. Um, Soldiers who died in the Great War is also on the website, so you'll be able to find out dates for them. War memorials, which are also on the website, um, will give you dates of death. And parish registers, obviously, will help you with that. Before 1858, um, they were proved locally. 
Um, there were more than 200 church courts. Obviously, before 1858, they were proven by the church. So each of these church courts kept separate index and registers of wills. Sadly, there's no central index, but many places like record offices do have their own online indexes, so that's not all lost. Um, to locate a will before 1858, you'll know to, need to know where your ancestor lived and died because you'll need to identify the court which dealt with the probate. So there are various court levels ranging from peculiars to the PCC, which was the largest church court in England. Um, that's the prerogative court of Canterbury. Um, there were three main factors that determined where you would have your will proved, where the person died, the value of the estate, and where the estate was geographically. So up till 1858, it was in, divided into two provinces, York and Canterbury. These had their own church courts, the prerogative court of York and the prerogative court of Canterbury. Those two provinces were further split into dioceses, and those were split into archdeaconries, which were then split into rural deaneries. So you can see it's not simple, but it is easy to do once you know what you're looking for. If the testator was relatively poor and his estate was held in one place, his probate was normally dealt with the archdeacon's court. If the estate was large or the estate went over into another archdeaconry, probate would need to be granted by the bishop, so that would need to go to the diocesan court. If the estate was in more than one diocese or was really large, or the person had ideas above his station, which often happened, um, the will was probed at the PCC or the PCY. So it's the prerogative court of Canterbury or the prerogative court of York. Other courts existed just to confuse matters, and these were called peculiars, and they were administered by the deans and chapters of cathedrals. So if your ancestor lived within the grounds of a cathedral or in some other areas, it could be in a peculiar, but that's something else to look into. Um, again, with my heritage, you'll be able to find the information on the England and Wales death indexes, the burials and obituaries, the burial and cremation indexes, and the England and Wales PCC index of will registers, 18. Uh, 1384 to 1858 and of course parish registers will also give you information about where and when people died if you need any help or would like to arrange a family history holiday in england um please contact me and there is my website so now probably esther wants to ask questions so i'll breathe <laughs> Let me just uh, take the slides down. There we go. We're back. <laughs> so firstly, thank you so much. That was really fascinating. All those different, uh, you know, different tips for looking at the wills and the different information that we can find there. It was just, uh, it was very interesting and something that I don't think that we've covered in the past on a My Heritage Facebook Live. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, and I see Barbara wrote here, outstanding, and I'm sure that everyone here in the audience just learned so much. Uh, Lavon wrote, I love this presentation. Uh, and for those of you who want to rewatch it, or you know, if, if you missed parts or you'd like to delve into it further, please know that um, you can watch this Facebook Live as well as all of our past Facebook Lives on the My Heritage Facebook page just under the videos section. So uh, definitely you can go and check it out again. So I'll just read. Uh, let's see. We have a right. couple questions if that's okay, Glenn. Okay, fantastic. Um, so we have a question here from Victoria. Uh, she said, can you please recommend a website and or book to decipher handwriting and abbreviations, uh, terms that are used in will. Um, if you, I mean, we'll go back to Google. I mean, Google is really good. So, I mean, if you just put in there deciphering old handwriting, there may well be something in there. Um, I don't know whether my heritage has anything to help with deciphering handwriting. I'm sure it does. Um, but the, my, my, First suggestion is that you look at a page of handwriting that looks a complete and utter mess, but there are going to be words on there that you'll be able to recognize. And then once you can recognize one word, you can then recognize another word. 
And if you just spend a little bit of time, you will soon be able to see what the person is writing because you'll then recognize his own or her own, mainly his, I'm afraid, his own handwriting. Um, it, it does take practice. It does take time. The, the terms used in wills, again, are very often the same over and over again. So if you, if you want to practice the terms used in wills, I suggest you look at more recent wills, so the ones from the 19th century, and then work backwards, because very often the same terms and terminology will still be used way back when, and then you'll recognise the terminology from the more recent wills. But if, if you've got any that you want me to have a look at, I'm more than willing just to have a look at some handwriting and transcribe a little section for you, then you'll be able to recognise what I've transcribed, if I can read it, which hopefully I can, <laughs> um, and then you'll be able to, to decipher it yourself. But, you know, I'm always happy to, to deal with inquiries direct, so um, just send me an email and I'll, I'll hopefully be able to help. Thank you. That's so generous of you. And uh, do you ever turn, let's say, to Facebook groups or to others to kind of get help with, you know, deciphering parts of, of, of handwriting that you can't, can't make out? Um, I normally use other people that I know. Or I, when I go to the, the, my local record office, if I'm having a real problem, I will take a, you know, a, a print out of it and ask them to have a look at it. And that no, local record offices are really, really helpful. And you've got people in there who have studied calligraphy. So you'll be able to um, get them to help you. But I, I really do say that it's amazing what you're able to do yourself just by looking at a page of writing and picking out words that you know to be a certain word. So once you know three or four words, you've then probably got a lot of the alphabet, how he wrote the alphabet in that document. So say, for instance, even if you've got, you know, the name of the person, you know, William Cooper, at least you then know how he writes a capital W, an I, L's, M's, A's, you know, a C. An it's o, a start. It's a, a good start. <laughs> exactly. So you, it's amazing how much we can learn ourselves just by looking at what's in front of us. Fantastic. I see a very similar question from Barbara here. She said, uh, sometimes wills are very hard to read. What is the best route to take? So, so I guess the same idea. Yeah, yeah, I, it is definitely looking at the paper and don't don't try and do the whole document at once. You know, it's, it's like the old saying, you know, you can't eat an elephant in one sitting, <laughs> you know. Just have a look at a little part of the document. Just try and do the first two lines. And then once you've got the gist of those two lines, you can then see how the person who wrote it actually wrote those words and then all the other words, well, a lot of the other words will then jump off the page. It's it is quite amazing how quickly it can it can work. That expression has come up a, a few in a few of our Facebook lives recently, actually, oh, especially when we were talking about uh, New Year's resolutions and, and oh, genealogy no. goals for the next year. I think the idea was, you know, just bite off a little bit at a time. And it's yes. so funny how it just relates to so much of genealogy and family history, that, yeah. that expression. <laughs> it does. It does indeed. Incredible. Um, so now uh, we'd like to give away the My Heritage Complete Plan to one lucky winner here wow. in the audience. It's very exciting. Uh, a great plan that we can uh, give away, as we said before, the best plan we have to offer at My Heritage. So we're super thrilled. We received tons of comments, uh, really, really great comments from the audience about different discoveries that you've made. So thank you, everyone who wrote in. Uh, it's so nice hearing all the different ways that you're using my heritage to learn more about your family history. We love hearing about all your different discoveries and uh, we hope that it continues throughout 2022 and that you make lots of new discoveries. And now we're very excited to be able to gift the complete subscription to Elena Gisola Halonen. And Elena wrote to us and uh, her comment, she wrote to us, she said, we were able to verify 
our family oral history that my great grandmother's brother had an illegitimate daughter and the mystery man I was DNA matched uh, was a first uh, as a first cousin was indeed the cousin uh, as the oral family history said we have since met and connected um, and that's just so nice you know when a a yeah. DNA match can help you reaffirm something that you've heard for generations throughout your family. Yes. How incredible. And can I can I just jump in there talking about Ill illegitimacy? I mean, very often you will find stuff in wills about illegitimacy. I mean, one of my uh, ancestors, she left property to a child and she said, um, and I, I, I can't remember the all the names, but we'll say, um, I leave whatever to John Smith, who is the son of Mary Smith by Peter Brown, who was the, the husband of her sister. So it tells me that this woman had a child by her brother-in-law and there is no other way that I was going to find that out. No other way on this earth that I'm going to find out that this child was the product of a brother-in-law and a sister-in-law yeah. relationship. Fascinating. You know? but, but wills, you see, don't forget that the uh, wills were read after the person died. So then that person didn't care what was going to come out because they had already died. So actually it didn't matter that she was given away family secrets because she wanted to make sure that her grandson had some inheritance, even though he was illegitimate. So, so a lot know, comes they, out. <laughs> they, they, can, they can open up a can of worms, but they can also fill in a lot of blanks. So interesting. That's uh, such a, a good point and something, you know, that you've got, it, it's such a treasure when you find something like that. And as you said, it, you can just find so much more than, let's say, a living record when, from when they were alive and something they wanted to hide. Yes. Incredible. So congratulations, Alina, and we'll be in touch with you through private message to claim your prize. Right. Uh, Glenn, thank you so much for joining us today. That was so informative and fascinating, and we really appreciate it. And uh, thank you to everyone in our audience for joining us. We hope that you'll join us for many more Facebook Lives throughout the year, and uh, we hope to see you all soon. Thank you, everyone.